نصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين The Quran leaves no matter that matters for our life here or our faith in the hereafter without discussing it, explaining it and guiding us as to what to do with it. Starting from the beginning of our creation in several places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the experience the pilot family that is Adam and Eve he tells us about their creation their experience in paradise and their encounter with the shaitan and what happens when they listen to the shaitan and the Quran gives us vivid pictures that there is this constant communication between us and the shaitan. He never gives up on whispering and talking, uh, indicating, implying, insinuating, and attracting and tempting. All of the tricks you can talk about, you count them, and they will be less than what the shaitan does. So today I want to take you with the uh, part of the segment of the story and the following instructions that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala following what happened between Adam and Eve. The story in brief is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited Adam and Eve to enter into paradise. Some of us think that it was a permanent residence status, but it was only a pilot program, exposure. So he doesn't tell them live there forever, or this is your house. No, paradise continues to be the house of Allah and anyone that goes to paradise is a guest. But once a guest, forever you are a guest. This is the beauty of it. But in those times when Allah created Adam and Eve, the invitation was a temporary one. And you will see that Allah is telling them, enjoy everything there is, but don't eat from that tree. Don't let the shaitan persuade you or tempt you, lest he would kick you out of paradise. فَلَا يُخْرِجَنَّكُمَا مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ فَتَشْقَى Let him not kick you out of paradise, lest you, Adam, would suffer. Does this mean that Eve would not suffer. No, it does mean that she will suffer. Because when Allah speaks to Adam, he always is talking to Adam and to his children. It is like when Allah speaks to Prophet Muhammad. He is talking to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and to his followers. So that goes without saying it is a style in the Quran that whatever Allah instructs, it's instruction for everybody. So we have to be careful not to assume things that have no bearing in the text. So he invites them and he tells them what are the parameters that you do not eat from that tree, that you do not listen to the shaitan, that the shaitan is your enemy. In هَذَا عَدُوٌ لَكَ وَلِزَوْجِكَ what an amazing clarity. Very clear where you're hiding, what is your test, what to avoid, who's your enemy, whom should you listen to, very clear. But then we know what happened. Adam forgot what he was told and he listened to the shaitan. His wife followed him and they were kicked out of paradise. Now, there is a stop on their coming out of paradise. When Allah commanded 
Satan to get out of paradise, he was commanded and pushed with a curse. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَتِي إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينِ My curse will follow you until the day of judgment. But Adam and Eve were first forgiven and then they were sent to earth. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Adam received words of repentance and words of mercy from Allah and Allah accepted his repentance. Then he told him, now you and your wife get down to earth, which is the place of their creation. So there was no change of plan as some of us thinks that, you know, Allah wanted them there for good but they violated the rules, so they changed Allah's plans. No, they did not. Or that Allah became so angry that he wouldn't accept them anymore and they are sent down with a curse. No, the Quran is very clear. They were forgiven before they were sent. Why is this important? Because as it says, in the Bible and as it says in the Quran وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى No soul gets the burden of another soul. You sin, you bear the consequences of your sin. What about the sayings that when someone sins, those, those sins can carry over to the seventh generation and all of that. It has no bearing with the text of the Quran. The text of the Quran is absolutely clear. There is a benefit of coming up in a righteous family. We see this in Surah Al-Kahf. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Their parents, those children, the, the parent of these two children was a righteous parent and that's how and why Allah wanted to replace them with children better than what Allah took. So there is a benefit for a righteous parent that his children will continue to be protected. That's a benefit. But there is no such a thing as a sin that runs in the family, whether it is through the genes or through false assumptions or misunderstanding. There is no such a thing. So Adam sinned and his wife followed. And we also learn in the Quran that the sin was Adam's sin. Unlike the biblical reference that makes it look like it was Eve who was the source of evil. And I don't know the connection if there's any that she tempted Adam and got him out of paradise. That is not, again, the text in the Quran. The text in the Quran says that man takes responsibility for what man does, and a woman takes responsibility for what the woman does. No children, nobody else bears responsibility for what they have done. Also, the assumption that uh, what kind of tree was it? Because again, the biblical references tell us that it is a tree of knowledge and that God was afraid if Adam and Eve were to eat from that tree, they will become like us, like Allah. Of course, this is a farce. There is no such a thing to support this claim in the Quran, nor is it supported logically. How is it that Allah, the Creator, with fear if, unless we assume he doesn't know what's going to happen, unless we assume he created a creation and he doesn't know how this creation will behave, then he is worried. But Allah, if you give him knowledge, then it must be consistent with his attribute, which means it must be absolute. It cannot be limited. That he knows everything except, no, there is no exception. So all of those assumptions around that story that people build religions around have no bearing in the text, in the Quran, 
and they cannot be consistently explained or justified even if you use purely biblical references to the same story. One of the things that comes also as a result of attributing the fall or the sin to Eve is also referenced in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that because of her temptation and her pulling Adam out of paradise and kicking him out of the mercy of Allah, none of this is true, then Eve must suffer. And what is her suffering? Now she has to have monthly period, she has to have bleeding, childbearing, and post childbearing and delivery, bleeding, all of that, which is the norm of her creation. As I mentioned before, a woman is the factory of the human race. Where do you produce humans? It is in that womb that is honored and dignified by Allah. You know, one of the ultimate, most important commands in the Quran is Silat al-Rahim, to connect with your kin, relatives, and family. And the Arabic language calls it Silat al-Rahim, to connect those who are connected to you through the womb. There is a blood relationship, whether they are siblings, or cousins, or far relatives, or tribal members, all, then all of humanity is connected. So again, that assumption of uh, reflexive punishment on Eve, again assumes that Allah doesn't know what he was going to do, and when she sinned, he decided to change her biology and make her do what she does now. Amazing assumption. It is inconsistent uh, with the values entrenched in the Old and New Testament, and it is inconsistent absolutely with the teachings of Islam. But it's quite unfortunate that some Muslims copy things as they are, and they think that it is what it is. So we have Muslim men who talk about women as you, you sisters got out of paradise. You sisters did this. You sisters, if it were not for you, we would have been in paradise today. All of these are false conclusions that are based on false assumptions. So, how do we know what is the plan of Allah and what it was? And how do we debunk all of these false assumptions? It is in one statement in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels, as he was about to create Adam, he tells them, I am going to create a vice gerent, a steward on earth. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi, on earth, a steward. So from the beginning, Allah knew that Adam was going to go to paradise, and he was going to violate, and he was going to be sent down, and it is his divine wisdom that we are created from earth, we live on earth, we are buried on earth, and we are resurrected on earth. Of course, on that day, may Allah save us from its horrors, on that day, the earth will be different. Things will be different. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ Even heavens, والسماوات. So, while things will be similar, but they will be inherently different. So, with the story reaching this, what are the lessons now for us? And this is the crux of what we need to focus on today. After this ayat of Adam and Eve coming to earth, and finally starting this journey, what are the lessons and what are the instructions that came from Allah to us, the children of Adam? Now that your first, real first family have gone through their own experience, what are your lessons? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adama, قَدْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسًا يُوَارِي سَوْآتِكُمْ وَرِيشًا وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ O children of Adam, we have sent down unto you clothing that covers your shame. Warisha. And what is Risha? Risha is luxury clothing. Clothing that you wear 
in Eid and in good occasions that he were to show off the bounties of Allah and to, to express the blessings that Allah has given you so that you don't hide it and show yourself as poor. So luxury clothing is called Rish or Riyash. Uh, but then it follows. وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ And the clothing of taqwa is better. What is the clothing of taqwa? If there's such a thing that we're missing on, what is the clothing of taqwa? The clothing of taqwa is the Qur'an. It is the signs, the guidance of Allah. The light that He has sent down is what brings taqwa to us. And taqwa is here likened to clothing because it covers our spiritual aura. So as the clothing cover our physical shame or privates, taqwa covers our fear of Allah, our conscience, our respect for His rules, covers our spiritual aura. It covers our sinfulness. How? Again, the ayah comes in the same surah. We explained it before, but it doesn't hurt to go over the same again. وَإِذْ وَطْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ الَّذِي آتَيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا فَانْسَلَخَ مِنْهَا And recite unto them our evidence and signs and verses that we have given as a clock, as clothing, as skin cover to the one who immediately started to skin himself off of it. Again, وَاتْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ الَّذِي آتَيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا فَانْسَلَخَ مِنْهَا So the ayat are described as cloaks or clothing or covers. Then how do you skin yourself off of it? When you take it off, you get exposed. When you get exposed, you get attacked. It's like taking off your skin. The Qur'an describes the ayat, the revelation, and the guidance of Allah as if they were as good a protection for you spiritually as the skin is a protection for your body physically. And when you turn away from the ayat of Allah, when you take it off, the Qur'an likes, likens it to skinning yourself off of your own skin. فَانْسَلَخَ مِنْهَا What happens? Exposed, then فَأَتْبَعَهُ الشَّيْطَانُ فَكَانَ مِنَ الْغَوِينَ Then Satan followed, ran after him, tracked him. فَأَتْبَعَهُ الشَّيْطَانُ فَكَانَ مِنَ الْغَوِينَ And he fell and he became per a person who accepts and is vulnerable to temptations. When you open yourself up for infection, don't blame the germs of having a feast on you. That's nature. When you divorce yourself from the guidance of Allah, don't blame the shaitan for having a feast with you. Because that's the norm. This is the norm. And the ayat talking about the story, it told us how Satan tempted Adam. He told him, Adam, يَا آدَمُ هَلْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى شَجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ وَمُلْكٍ لَا يَبْلَى Should I tell you about the tree of eternity and a kingdom that never perishes? So what is the shaitan using? The shaitan using what you love to talk to you. Adam and his children, we love to live for eternity. Who doesn't want to live here for eternity? Anyone? So, the shaitan knows this. إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ So he talks Adam into the idea of eternal life. And then he talks him into a kingdom that never perishes. Who doesn't want semi-kingdom, semi-kingdom, something like a kingdom, a garden, a house, a mansion, if you don't want it, raise your hand. Everybody is working their tail off to get this mansion 
as their own. But Allah told us that there were people who lived in mansions and palaces here, but their heart was living with Allah and their ultimate game was not even a mansion in paradise. They only asked for a house, a dwelling in paradise. The wife of Pharaoh. إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّبْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ عِنْدَكَ is what's important. O oh Allah, build for me, with you, with you, a house in paradise. I want to be next to you. I want to be close to you. This is where my heart is. So she lived in the palaces physically here, but they meant nothing. For those of us who are still working their tail off to get a palace in this life, this is a woman that Allah used as an ultimate example for the believers. All the believers, men and women, they should take example of the wife of Pharaoh. But the other example also, not to forget, is the mother of Isa alayhi salam that accepted the test, the huge test she was put through based on her trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah gave her the news, when the angel told her the news coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she was shocked. How could I have a son when no man has touched me? But once he told her it is Allah's command, she accepted it. So she was also picked as another twin example with the wife of Pharaoh. The two stood and stand today to be the ultimate example of faith. Likewise, another third woman that was picked as an example is the mother of Musa alayhi salam. When Allah told her, take your son, put him in the box, throw him in the, in the sea or in the water, and don't worry about it. Whose mother's heart would not worry about her baby, baby, thrown in the water? And the Quran describes that she was suffering from that void, that fear. And Allah is the one who gave her comfort in her heart. So that she becomes one of the believers. So we have three women in the Quran referenced as ultimate level of faith. Because of their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Bani Adama, qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuari sawatikum warisha wa libasu taqwa thalika khayr thalika min ayati allahi la'allahum yadhakkaroon This is one of the signs and evidence and proofs from Allah so that they may remember. Remember what? So that people, the children of Adam, may remember the story of their father and their mother, the real first family, that once they forgot and once was one too many. And were it not for the mercy of Allah, it would have been the same. As I mentioned, Satan was kicked out of paradise cursed, but Adam was not kicked out, he was sent down to where he belongs on earth. So what are the benefits of his experience? Knowing what we know now, we should be very careful. So the following instruction, يَا بَنِي آدَمَ لَا يَفْتِنَنَّكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ O children of Adam, don't you be tempted and tested by Satan as he did with your parents. كَمَا أَخْرَجَ أَبَوَيْكُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ But now, if you fall to the temptation of shaitan, Satan, today, it is not going to be that you're going to be kicked now from this temporary paradise. It is that you lose the permanent one. This is a huge difference. So, in his experience, what happened to Adam, the Quran explains. The Quran says, وَنَسِيَ آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى 
وعصى آدم ربه فغوى ثم اجتباه ربه فتاب عليه وهدى. The other ayah says that ولقد عهدنا إلى آدم من قبل فناسيا ولم نجد له عزما. We have taken the covenant of Adam to keep up with our command but he forgot and we found him without resolve. He did not have the resolve and the will to live up to Allah's commands. This is a human weakness. And this is the reference in which Allah SWT says, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا ضَعِيفًا is not only physically. We are physically, admittedly, we are very weak. But we are also weak in all other capacities. Our power is limited. Our abilities are limited. Look at the maximum power you can do. What? Go to the space, but there is a limit to that. And you have to come back. No matter what. So, there are limitations on the power we have, and those limitations constitute our vulnerabilities and our weakness. And when you are a physician, and you examine a child, and tell his parents, don't expose him to his brother because his brother has chicken pox and this child is too weak as he also is sick there is a huge vulnerability what do you do you expose them anyway if you are a wise parent who cares for your child you don't so Allah knowing our weakness he is telling us Satan is not only the enemy of your parents it is also your enemy ألم أعهد إليكم يا بني آدم ألا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين. So as he told Adam, this is an enemy for you and for your wife. He is telling the entire humanity, Satan is your enemy and the enemy of everyone else. And then what? Don't expose yourself with your vulnerability to the shaitan. So how do we protect ourselves against those vulnerabilities? And what are the venues through which Satan comes to us? Satan, all what he has of power is the power of temptation through talking to you. He is constantly talking to you as he was talking to Adam and Eve, telling them, no, he is also talking to you, but he is using your vulnerabilities. He is using your desires. So if you want power, this is his venue, this is his access. If you want money, that becomes his access. If you are a man or woman who worships their desires, desires become his venue and access to you. If you love your children too much, that they are competing with Allah's love in your heart, He will use your children to tempt you. Because His job is temptation. His job is temptation. So the Quran tells us, do not follow the shaitan. Do not worship the shaitan. Do not listen to the shaitan. Do not obey the shaitan. Why? He is your clear enemy. So take him for the enemy he is. إن الشيطان لكم عدو فاتخذوه عدوا. Unfortunately, many of us do not even recognize that they are taking the shaitan as a guest in their life, a permanent companion. So they consult with the shaitan. When they are angry, the first consultation doesn't come from Allah, it comes from the shaitan. So the Quran says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا مَا غَضِبُوا هُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ And the shaitan is saying, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا مَا غَضِبُوا هُمْ يَقْتُلُونَ So we listen to the shaitan. The Quran says, and those describing the believers, and those are the ones who, when and if they get angry, their impulsive, instantaneous reaction is forgiveness. The shaitan says, no, the, the natural reaction, if you're angry, to kill somebody, to hurt somebody, to curse somebody. So we are having a companionship that is not, and it shouldn't be welcomed by the believer. But we as Muslims, 
and many who believe in God are living and enjoying the company and the temptation of Satan only because it's either pleasant or it feels good or it gives me what I want or I may avoid some cost like cheating on anything or lying you can avoid a lot of things by lying you can avoid responsibilities by lying like parents who abandon children because they go through divorce so the father says I'm not gonna give them a penny who's telling him it's not Allah definitely it's not Allah and definitely it's not good friends and if there are friends advising parents not to pay their dues for their children those are human devils those are not friends so Allah tells us in the Quran yes there is such a thing as human devils shayateen al-ins wal-jinn yuhi ba'dhuhum ila ba'din zukhruf al-qawli gurura the human and spiritual devils they both tempt and keep whispering until you listen to them so long as you open yourself for their company they will not leave you alone and that's why the Quran insists that if you want to pick friends pick ones who are righteous who are going to protect you to remind you of the clock of protection the clock of taqwa piety and righteousness and goodness and purity and care and love and compassion those are the qualities of the believer they should come natural and the opposite is the cloak of the shaitan so if you don't keep good righteous companions around you as your closest intimate friends definitely you are keeping someone else that someone could be a human devil or a real devil when you give your ears to the devil your ears will have no space for Allah and this is a description in the Quran hearing they hear not seeing they see not so what is the problem why don't we see anymore why don't we hear anymore because our eyes are filled with the images that the shaitan throws at us our ears are filled with what the shaitan whispers into us and the longer and the more we talk and listen to the devil the more impacted our life becomes so we don't have as much peaceful homes as we used to we don't have as much peaceful communities as we used to we don't have as much peaceful societies as societies used to be we don't have a peaceful world as the world once was in those righteous days when people would sit down as tribes and neighbors and solve issues through discussions instead of wars as the first option so brothers and sisters ya bani adam la yaftinannakum ash-shaytan kama akhraja abawaykum min al-janna what happens yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma shaytan satan who tempted your parents he ended up uncovering their private parts and they were shamed and they were ashamed and they started to pick tree leaves to cover themselves but covering your physical private sinfulness or aura or desires or anything else is one thing but what covers your spiritual aura your spiritual vulnerabilities and weaknesses it is your faith it is your relationship with Allah so the more you listen to Allah the less time you have to listen to the devil the more you live with Allah's guidance the less chance that you will be guided by the devil and on the day of judgment Satan will come and he will tell us openly I had no power over you guys come on don't blame me for much don't I had no power over you except the power of temptation except that I invited you and you listen to me this is the only power so it is like the power of leadership what is the power of leadership it is the followers who give the power to the leaders 
By following the leader, the leader has power. What is his power? Having followers. If you don't have followers, by definition, you are no leader. So if Satan doesn't have your ears, your eyes, and your mouth, and your hand, you have them all, and you could use them the way you want. So he has no power. If you just tell him, no, I am not interested, then you have reclaimed your own spiritual power of your faith, relying on your love of Allah and your fear of the consequences. You may lose the eternal paradise. May Allah make us all among the people of paradise. <laughs> Please turn off your cell phones if you have not yet. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala ali wa sahbi wa man wa wa ba'd. The ayah continues, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ He sees you from wherever you could not see him. While this is a challenge, but once you know what the challenge is, you should be ready to deal with it. Seeing us means that he knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He knows your individual inclinations. But much more, he knows your inclination as a human being. And he knows the composition of your soul, what you love and what you hate, what you fear, and how do you feel secure, safe, and comfortable. So he uses all of this as strings to pull, to tempt you to do what he wants you to do. What is the instruction? Don't fall for him. Don't fall for the shaitan. لا يفتننكم الشيطان Don't let the shaitan put you through testing and trials by violating the orders of Allah. By listening to the shaitan, you're giving your enemies your ears and your heart. By pushing the shaitan away, you have a chance you could be listening to your own conscience, to your own heart, to your own faith, and to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the crux and the heart of the human struggle in this life. Bring any problem that any human being anywhere has, this is the reasoning behind it. Whom are you listening to? So today, I would leave you with this. The ayah says, إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرَ وَالْفُؤَادَ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولَ Indeed, the hearing and the sight, the sight, which is your sight, your eyes, and your heart are but responsibilities that you will have to answer about before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the responsibility? Protect your eyes, protect your hearings, protect your heart from the temptation of Satan. And if you want to have control over your environment, the best way is to exercise control over what Allah gave you control over. Anybody else controls your eyes or ears? No, it's you. Anybody controls your heart? No, it's you. So you give any of that to Satan or to your neighbor, then you become a worshiper and a follower of Satan or that neighbor or that friend. So here is what we need to consider for this week. What are we doing with our ears, with our eyes, and with our hearts? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our hearts that we only use our ears and our uh, eyes to see the signs of Allah and the guidance of Allah and to see the straight path and follow through it. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt. Wa aafina fi man aafayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma aqsim lana min khashyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna ma'asir. 
ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا اللهم طهر قلوبنا من النفاق والرياء وطهر أخلاقنا من النفاق والرياء اللهم أخلص قلوبنا وأخلص أعمالنا وأخلص نياتنا وأصلح بالنا وبلغنا مما يرضيك آملنا اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا اللهم انصر عبادك المجاهدين في كل مكان اللهم ثبت أقدامهم واجمع كلمتهم ووحد صفهم وسدد رميتهم وانصرهم على عدوك وعدوهم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم انصر إخواننا في كل مكان اللهم انصر إخواننا في كل مكان اللهم عليك بالطغاة والجبارين فإنهم لا يعجزونك اللهم خذهم أخذ عزيز مقتدر اللهم ولي أمور المسلمين خيارهم ولا تولي أمورهم شرارهم اللهم احشرنا في الآخرة مع الحبيب المصطفى وارزقنا من يدي الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظما بعدها أبدا أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة